Father, we give thanks for the great and wondrous power and truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we come into your presence this morning, we do so with great joy in and through the grace and mercy that is ours in Christ. Lord, that you have pardoned us from all of our sins, that you have redeemed us by his blood, that you have brought us through Christ the Savior into your glorious presence, that we might be sons and daughters of the Most High, that we may know you as Abba, Father. And so, Lord, we pray that as we come this morning before the throne of grace, and as we raise up our hearts and our voices to you in praise and adoration and worship, that it would indeed be pleasing in your sight. We pray that as we are here, the aroma of Christ, that the very fragrance of Jesus himself may be evident to all those whom we interact with, with all those whom we know. Lord, that you would work a, a work in us and through us by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, by the outpouring of your love and the uh, exhibition of your character through us, your saints, the redeemed of God here in this place. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come, that we can come freely and without fear. We can come into your presence, that we can open your word, that you have given us cognitive ability to be able to understand intellectually and academically your word and your precepts, your principles, that we are able to lay hold of faith. Lord God, we pray that you would build faith within us, that we would be a faithful people as you are a faithful God. You are ever faithful. You are a God slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And so, Lord, we pray that we too would know that and that we would exhibit that ourselves. Lord, we thank you that in you we have nothing to fear that you are our Savior and that you are our light, that we may, may and need fear no thing, that you have called us by name, that you have redeemed us, that you have set us apart. 
And so when the waters threaten to overwhelm or where the fire engulfs, we know, Lord God, that we are safe and secure in your everlasting arms. We pray for those who are not certain of that. We pray for those, perhaps even present today, who do not know that great hope of Jesus within their own hearts and lives, be that young folk or older folk, be that those who have never heard the gospel before or those who have sat under the sound of the gospel for decades and yet have been unmoved by it. Lord, we pray that you would speak into hearts and lives today, that we would see the great benefit, the great benefits, the privileges, the perks of being the children of God, of being the people of God, of being those who are set apart as God's ambassadors, His workforce here on earth recognizing that you are a God who desires that none would perish. And so, you have sent to us those who know you and those who love you and the witness of their experience. And so, Lord, we pray that we would listen to that. We pray that through your Spirit, you would move. We thank you that you are a God who continues to transform lives. You are a God who is able to do the unimaginable. You are the God who is not bound by the things we are bound by but that you transcend these things. You are the God who is high and who is lifted up, King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, we confess to you our waywardness and our weakness. We confess to you the way in which we are enticed and tempted by the things that the world would espouse to be good and right and true, which we know to be wrong. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful to you and to the things of your word and your will and that in doing so we might know the blessing, the continued blessing of a God who is good. We pray for our nation in these days. We pray for the nations of the world in these days where there is so much turmoil, where there is so much unrest, politically and otherwise. We pray for the elections forthcoming in our own nation. Lord, we pray for men and women of integrity, of transparency, of diligence, uh, to be raised up, to be in positions of power and authority, and those who you have elected, who you have put in these places for a purpose and for a reason, Lord. We pray that you would use them uh, for your ends, for your purposes. We pray for Daniels to be raised up, those who possess an excellent spirit within them, those who would be distinguished from their countrymen through their excellent spirit, working hard for you. We thank you, Lord, that you have placed many of us into the workplace And the workplace is the arena by which we live out our faith. The workplace is the opportunity that you have given to us to demonstrate our faith and how we respond in the way in which we speak, in the way in which we interact with those not only whom we serve through our work, but those who we work alongside. Lord, we recognize that so much of our lives are devoted to work. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us a theology of work as we delight in the work that you have given us and in the works that you have set apart for us to do. We pray that we would do these things gladly, and that we would do these things showing, exhibiting, demonstrating the faith that we have and the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would redeem not just individuals, not just families and communities, but workplaces, uh, churches. We pray for a renewal and a restoration of all that is good And so we pray that you would raise up men and women to facilitate and to enable that according to your will. We pray this morning for those who are unwell, those who are faced with difficulty within their own lives and experiences, those whose problems are beyond their own capacity to cope with or to deal with. And Lord, we thank you that you are sufficient for all things and your grace sufficient for every circumstance. And so we commend to your gracious loving care those who are in need of that. Lord, we remember the many who are away on holiday at this time, uh, taking advantage of time off from school, and those who are with us here today on holiday uh, uh, with us from different places. Lord, we thank you that we are one in Christ Jesus, that you have united us through the blood of Christ. And we pray for rest, for rejuvenation, for relaxation, and for renewal for all of those who are enjoying a time of holiday at the moment. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been studying John's gospel for some time now, and we're in one of the the great chapters uh, of John's gospel. They're all great, but this is perhaps one of the best known, uh, most quoted, especially uh, in funerals, as it talks about the peace uh, of Jesus. But there is so much more that we can learn from this chapter than just about uh, God's peace. 
Uh, Jesus, this you remember, is in the upper room. He is in uh, the, the process of uh, discipling His disciples. So, He's gone from the public ministry, and this is really entering into this private element of, of ministry, this time where He's with His disciples for these times, instructing them, encouraging them, uh, leading them in the way they should go and what they should do and how to prepare themselves for what uh, lies ahead. And there is so much uh, practical application for us uh, within these chapters. So, I'm only going to look at three verses this morning. You say, are we ever going to get through John's gospel? We will. We'll get through John's gospel, but we're not going to sacrifice the, the jewels of it just for the sake of, of speed. So, uh, God's Word is profitable. It's helpful. Uh, John wrote all of these things with a mind of belief. He wants people to believe. He, he, uh, he recounts all of these things, as he says later in, in the book. Uh, all of these are included, uh, some of the miracles, not all of the miracles, but the ones that are included are included that you may believe, and that by believing you may have life in Jesus' name. That's really his modus operandi, his MO, his motive, his motivation for writing uh, this book, and it's good for us to dwell on it. So, we're going to read the verses marked uh, 1 to 14 of John 14 this morning. We're going to focus on verses 12 to 14 uh, for our thoughts. This is Jesus speaking and addressing His disciples where He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You have a choice in that. It is your volition. Remember, we talked about that. You believe in God, believe also in Me. Keep on believing in God, keep on believing in Me. My Father's house has many rooms if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, and the truth, and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves." Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Father, we thank You for that great truth that you desire, Your desire is that none would perish. Uh, and Lord, we lay hold of that and hold on to that as a motivation to live and to witness and to work for the things of God, to give ourselves over as fellow workers in Christ to the things of God, to commit ourselves to Your cause and to Your kingdom to work in a way which is pleasing to You and which is of benefit not only to ourselves but to those around about us. Lord, we pray for a movement of Your Spirit amongst Your people. We pray for a dissipation and a, 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 a dissipation of any indifference. We pray that uh, any difference, indifference to the gospel and its cause here in this place might be vanquished. We pray, Lord, for a fervency. We pray for a passion. We pray for a zeal, a renewal and enthusiasm for the things of God, where that has perhaps waned within our own lives and within our own experiences. Uh, we pray that as a congregation of Your people, as the body of Christ gathered here in this place, that uh, the work of the Spirit would unite and bind us together with cords that cannot be broken, 
uh, that we would be a people who are focused on uh, and devoted to the kingdom of God. Lord, that you would work in us through your Spirit, that you would work through uh, your Word, for we give thanks for that great promise that your Word will not return to you void. And so we pray that we would be absolutely, completely, and wholly devoted to the Word of God, to prayer, knowing that you hear and that you answer our prayers. And now, Lord, we pray that as we open your Word afresh this morning and as we dwell on it for just a short time, that you would transform our hearts for, from within, that we might be renewed and rejuvenated and rejoicing as we leave this place this afternoon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, turn back with me to John chapter 14, and I really want to just focus today on the perks of the job, because really every Christian believer that follows Jesus is an employee of the kingdom of God. We are called to expend ourselves in working for the Lord, in witnessing for Him, and telling others about Him. You see, the Christian faith is not all about consumerism. What can I get? What's in it for me? Bless me. Give me. I want to take. Now, of course, we are blessed. We are blessed beyond measure in and through the Word of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are blessed beyond measure through uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. These things are a given. But as the Lord's people, as those who have received the salvation and the great gift of salvation through Christ Jesus, it is our role, it is our only role, arguably, to work for the Lord here in the time that we have been allotted, the time that we have been given, the work that has been set apart for us to do. Because the Word of God is very clear. We are fellow workers together with Him. That's what Paul reminds us in Corinthians uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, we are fellow workers, fellow laborers in the gospel with Him. And if you think about it, we work for the best company, the best corporation in the world. Our product works universally. It is universally applicable. No matter where you go in the world, you will find that the gospel works. The gospel is relevant the gospel is necessary. The gospel is longed for. Regardless of where you go in the world, generally, you will find offices of our company. Go anywhere and you'll find at least one or two other uh, believers who represent the company that we work for. We have a benefits package, as we were just talking about with the, the kids, that is outstanding, that is unmatched, that is out of this world, forgiveness for our past sins, meaning and purpose in our present life, and peace of mind for the future, a retirement package that is quite literally out of this world. These are benefits to us, perks of the job, if you will. These perks, these privilege, privileges uh, are, are because God wants to use us in His employ. He wants to utilize the gifts that He has bestowed upon us for His purposes. He wants to use us to the fullness of our potential. So often we're not doing that because we're seeking to forge our own path and go in a different direction to the one that the Lord has set apart for us to do. We're fighting against things rather than going with where the Lord has led us to. Now, here we are in John's Gospel. We've been in it for some time, I know. We're dealing with the Upper Room Discourse right now, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, all happen in this one setting, this last, this final meal, this Passover meal that Jesus is sharing with His disciples, His apostles, as we, as we call them. There are just a few hours left before Jesus will go to the cross. And what He's doing in these final few moments is He's teaching he's teaching his men, he's teaching his disciples. He's not entertaining them. He's not really counseling them in that, in that sense. He's not telling them what they should do with their money, where they should invest their finances. No, he's telling them that they should invest in God's global plan, which includes them. Now, let me remind you that in the course of this last supper, in this upper room, 
as Jesus is talking, he's interrupted on a number of occasions, and we've looked at them, haven't we? Let me just recap quickly. The first was Peter. Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And, and why can't we follow? And Jesus says, well, you can't follow me right now, Peter, but later you will, you will follow. And then it's Thomas's turn, and Thomas says, well, I, you say that we know the way to where you're going. We don't know the way, so how, how can we know uh, what to do? He says, well, um, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. And then the third interruption is from uh, Philip. Philip's tired of the ambiguity that he senses, and he wants something concrete. So he says, Lord, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. We'll be happy. And in effect, what Jesus says is, Philip, you're looking at him. Here I am, standing right before you in your presence. Have I been with you for all this time? And still, you do not recognize who I am. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I am the exact representation we know from uh, elsewhere in uh, Scripture. I am in such intimate contact with the Heavenly Father that if you look at me, you see Him. Now, at this point, in verse 12 of chapter 14, the focus of the Lord is upon the future plan of God that includes these disciples who He is addressing. So, I just want to look at these three verses this morning. Verse 12, very truly I tell you, Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. These are fabulous promises. These are groundbreaking promises, but they're often misunderstood promises. They're often promises that are taken wildly out of context, and then people wonder uh, why they're not working or they don't truly understand them. One blessing that you and I have is that we have the completed canon of Scripture. We have the revelation of God. We have the Bible. We have this book, and we have the opportunity to ponder it, to read it, to reflect on it, to study it. We have the opportunity to ponder its context and understand that context and, and what leads to certain things, and context is king. We, we can plumb its depths. We can consider its meaning it's almost better than having been there. You know, so often we think, why wouldn't it just have been amazing to have been in the upper room? Wouldn't it just have been amazing to sit under the tutelage of Jesus and to listen to Him teach? Oh, it would have been amazing to be there. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure it would. But you know, we have in some senses a greater opportunity than even the disciples had, because we can look at the whole picture. We can understand what that which they could not understand at the time, which we've looked at, at previously. I'm not going down that route today. But we have an opportunity to look at the event divorced from the emotion of the moment. You know what I mean? Sometimes emotion, sometimes being in the moment can cloud our understanding or our vision. We can look at things objectively because we're looking back. We have the evidence. We have the record of it. The disciples in that room that night, their emotions were, whoa, they were up there, and then they were uh, immediately uh, at the opposite end. They're dealing with doubts, and they're dealing with fears, and they think that they're on one trajectory, and Jesus says, oh no, boys, we're going in quite a different direction to the way you thought we were going. So, they're up here, and then they're down uh, there. So, we have a greater opportunity in some respects than even the disciples did, because we have the broader picture, we have the record of it, and we can look at context, we can look at meaning, we can look at depths. But really, what I want to look at for a short time this morning is the perks of the job, the perks of the job, the privileges that are ours for working for God, being part of His plan, being part of His workforce, being in His employment. The first perk is the perk of purpose, the perk of purpose. The great number one privilege, we can say here, first of all, is that we have the perk of purpose. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me. Now, Jesus uses a term there that's not unfamiliar. We've heard it before. Verily, verily. Truly, truly, most assuredly, in the Greek, amen, amen. This is, this is a note to the reader. It's a note to his audience that what he's going to say 
is of significance. Stop, listen, take heed, take note. Most assuredly, very, very, verily, verily, very truly, I tell you. In other words, what I'm going to say, listen to it. It's worth listening to. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus speaks here of works. The Greek word is erga. That's where we get the word energy from. It means activity. It means energy expounded. That's the general etymology of the word. In other words, there is some divine activity that God wants you and I to expend our energy on. He wants us to have a purpose. There is a purpose in living for Him, in working uh, for Him. And that is one of the greatest struggles that people wrestle with in their lives, isn't it? What is my purpose in life? Maybe you're wrestling with that right now in your own experience. Why am I here? What is it that I'm meant to be doing? What is the plan? What is my purpose for the rest of the time that I have on earth? And you see, if you don't have an answer to that, it can be very unsettling. It can be very confusing. It can be disorientating even. It's like taking an Amazonian tribesman and dumping them in Piccadilly Circus and saying, get on with it. What? The guy's never seen vehicles before. He's never seen concrete before. He's never seen a multitude of people like that before. He doesn't understand English. He doesn't know what traffic or traffic laws are. He's never seen uh, a car. He doesn't understand that in the culture he's now in that you buy your food. You don't kill it. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know what to do. It would be cruel, wouldn't it, to dump somebody into a place like that. Some of us would say we wouldn't like to be dumped into Trafalgar Square or anywhere like it. Well, so too is it to live in God's universe without understanding God, His plan, or His purpose, and how we fit into that. If we live outside of the Lord, outside of His plan, outside of His purpose, outside of His principles, of course we are always going to struggle, because it's not what we were designed for. Henry David Thoreau once said, most men and women lead lives of quiet desperation. You know why? Because they don't know what their purpose is. They don't know where their identity is. For the Christian believer, our identity and our purpose is found in Jesus Christ. In Christ, we understand that God is working out His plan in this present world, as broken as the system may be, and that we have a part to play in that ongoing work of redemption, that story of redemption that began in Genesis 3 and will continue until the culmination. What does Paul say in Ephesians 2.10? We are God's workmanship. Remember when we did our study in Ephesians 2? I'm sure you can remember every word. It's only four years ago or five years ago or six years ago. We are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece is the literal, literal translation. Created in Christ. Remember 27 times in that book, in Christ. Uh, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. He, ha he has it all mapped out. He knows what He is doing. So, here's the question that we have, first of all, this morning, and I know that time is moving incredibly quickly, but are you a Christian believer this morning? If you are, your identity is in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. You are a new creation in Him. Your purpose, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. What is that actually summed up by? To work for Jesus. To work for Jesus. Why do you think you're here? Are, are you here in the Lord's providence to earn a bit more money, to get a better job, to progress your career, to buy more land, to amass more things. Do you think that's why you're here? No, it's not why you're here. It might be what you're doing. It might be what you've fallen into because that's what the world says or because 
ultimately you're erroneously thinking that by doing these things you're going to give yourself or gain yourself more purpose, that your identity is actually in these things. And what that tells us is that they're idols and they're actually negative because you've enthroned them in your life, not the Lord. No, what are you to do? You're here if you're a Christian believer. You profess Christ this morning. You are His ambassador. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of another country representing that country in a different place. We are citizens of heaven if we are in Christ, and therefore we are ambassadors in a foreign country here on earth to represent heaven, to represent the Lord. Why? Because the Lord's desire is that none would perish. You want to reach the top in your chosen profession? Hey, that's a, that's a, noble, a noble task. It's, it's good to have zeal and purpose. Are you doing that at the expense of your Christian witness? Are you doing that at the expense of serving your church? You want to earn more money? Hey, it's good, but what's the reason for that? To amass more, to build it all up, to keep it to yourself, or to use it for the Lord's purposes, to share? You see what I mean? Our job is to fulfill the work that the Lord has set out before us. That is our purpose if we are a Christian believer. All of that has to be done through the work and the witness of the church, yes, but even more so in our individual lives as we work in the places that the Lord has put us, in the roles that He has placed us in, and amongst the people that He has set us. Our purpose is to enact the gospel through the gifts that He has given us faithfully as we exhibit them to the working, uh, to the watching world. You see, if we are completely invested in our job, our relationship, our family for the sake of that thing, and that is the driver, and that is the motivation, I tell you what that is? It's an idol. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. That's what John says elsewhere. You remove the Lord from the throne of your life, you enthrone something else there, that's an idol. However, when we truly understand, when we recognize our citizenship as heavenly, and we take a hold of the mandate that we have been given in and through Christ Jesus, the Savior of our souls, we will work well for Him, not just to earn those stripes, not just for personal gain or satisfaction, but so that through our ethic, through our example, through our excellent spirit, people might see Jesus. Is that your motivation for doing well at work, that people may see Jesus in you? When's the last time you verbalized Jesus to one of your colleagues? When's the last time you articulated your faith that's your purpose if you're a Christian. That is to be our purpose. And that's what Jesus is telling His disciples. He's saying, look, these are works that I want you to do. These are things that I have prepared for you to do, and I am now preparing for you to do them. Preparing you to do them is what He's doing. Roll up your sleeves, guys, He's saying. You have the privilege of knowing the purpose for your existence. That's how it works, isn't it? first stage of Christianity is salvation. It's to be saved. We're saved. We come to an end of ourselves. We come to an acknowledgement of our need. We come to a conviction of sin. We, we repent. We come to faith. We recognize our need of Jesus, the one who has shed His blood and died in our place. We come to Him in faith. We begin to grow in that faith, in our knowledge and our understanding. We come to church. We get fed. We get spiritually fed. We get fed some more. We might even get spiritually fat, academic knowledge pouring out of every uh, part of our minds. But it's not just to maintain that and keep that and hoard that and keep it to ourselves, isn't it? Because after a while, that becomes not enough. We, we recognize that we are not only to learn and to receive, but that we are to give, that we are to share, that we are to dispense that we are to be purveyors of the gospel. It is better, it is more blessed to give than to receive, says the Word. And so we enter into phase two of salvation, and that's service. Service. 
We're interested in our purpose, our plan for life. What are my spiritual gifts? What are the areas of talent that the Lord has given me? How can I employ these things for the glory of my God? How can I equip the saints for works of service? How can I uh, work into that? How can I be, like James said, a doer of the Word, not merely a hearer? So, the Lord is growing and maturing these disciples by showing them their first perk, their first privilege for working for God, and that is knowing their purpose. And that is our purpose, to make Him known. The second perk is the perk of promotion, uh, of proportion. The second privilege is the privilege of proportion. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. What could Jesus possibly mean by that? Greater works than Jesus did? I had a look around uh, in preparation for this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Synoptic Gospels, there are 40 miracles, roughly, that are recorded there in the Gospels. Real miracles, not things like saying, oh, the miracle of the sunrise. That's not a miracle. That's the natural order of things. When we're talking about miracles, we're talking about raising the dead, walking on water, calming the storm, having power over the elements, turning water into wine, feeding uh, people from just a, a couple of uh, fish and loaves. And yet Jesus says here, they will do even greater things than these. And those are just the recorded works, remember? Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book, says John. I've never raised a dead person, have you? I've never walked on the water. That'd be a real miracle. I've prayed for people, and sometimes they've got better, but sometimes they haven't. Sometimes they've died. So, what could Jesus possibly mean by telling His disciples that the works I've been doing, well, you're going to do even greater works than these? We say, oh, that's a head-scratcher, does it not? Let me give you three possibilities very quickly. Number one, maybe Jesus means miraculous physical works that the apostles will do. It's confirmed uh, or, or, or confined. It's confined really to just those apostles, those disciples that are in the room with Jesus, that they're going to do the same kind of miracles that Jesus performed. That's interpretation number one. And of course, they did that, didn't they? We know. You, you go to Acts chapter 5, and you read in verse 12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. Verse 15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that the crowd, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them. As he passed by, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing in their sick and those tormented and pure spirits, and all of them were healed. So, that's a lot of power amongst the apostles, isn't it? Physical, miraculous power manifest through the witness, through the ministry of the disciples. Here we have the disciples replicating, in some senses, the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus did in His own ministry. However, if we say that it just means these miraculous works, and these miraculous works are just for the apostles, we have a problem. Why, why do we have a problem? Because Jesus doesn't seem to limit it to just the apostles, does He? Very truly, I tell you, whoever. It's not just of the ones in the room, but whoever. Whoever believes in Me. Whoever believes in Me. So, interpretation number one is it's the apostles they are going to do the same thing as Jesus. There's a problem with that, though. Number two, when we turn to the book of Acts, yes, the apostles did miracles, but other people did miracles as well. Two deacons come to mind. Stephen was one of them. Philip, not the apostle, but Philip the deacon, is another one who did signs and wonders. They did signs and wonders. Hmm. If miraculous signs and wonders were only to be done by the apostles, then what about subsequent church history, men like Irenaeus and Tertullian, Martyr and Ignatius, first, second, third, fourth centuries, miracles were done by their hand. So, that's interpretation number one, physical signs and wonders are done by the apostles. Number two, Jesus is referring to physical signs and wonders done by everyone who has enough faith to believe. And those who hold that view are the kind of people who would use the word believe as, believe, it's a miracle. You know, the kind of TV evangelist 
that if you've just got enough faith, then you'll be okay. You'll be able to do amazing things. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This group espoused the idea that the reason we don't see miraculous signs and wonders is that people don't have enough faith to get it done. You have to speak a word in faith. Hmm. Now, here's the reason I don't think that it refers to those who have enough faith, because Jesus says, whoever believes in me, not believes that the miracle will be done. He doesn't say, if you believe the miracle will be done, it will be done. Amen. Hallelujah. No, he doesn't say that. He says, whoever believes in me, not whoever believes with a sufficient intensity, degree of faith, then the… the no, no. He says, whoever believes in me. And he makes a declaration, not an offer. Whoever believes in me will do, not might do, not could do, not if they have enough, enough faith could possibly do. No, he says will do. So, hold that thought, and then we'll move on a third way to look at it. I think it means something totally different. Could it be that Jesus is talking here about spiritual works, not physical works. And I think the key to understanding that is because the last phrase where Jesus says, because I am going to the Father. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Why is that important? Because when Jesus would go to the Father, what did He promise? the Holy Spirit. In fact, He says, I can't send you the Holy Spirit until I go to the Father, but when I go to the Father, I will send you the Holy Spirit. What does He say further on in this chapter? Verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, forever. That's the Holy Spirit. John 16, a couple of chapters ahead. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you. See, your context is so important. You can see how that would be a comfort to the apostles, right? They're thinking, Jesus is going, what is happening here? This is not what we were expecting. There goes the power. The whole thing is finished. Three years down the Swanee, it's all downhill from here. But Jesus turns it around completely and says, guys, it's not over. It's just beginning. I'm going to the Father, but the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Paraclete, the, the Helpmate. The Holy Spirit is going to make His dwelling within you along with me and the, and the Father. And, he, and He's going to give you power to do incredibly different things. So, I think when Jesus says greater works, He doesn't mean greater in power, greater in magnitude, greater in intensity. It means greater in extent, and that's different. Now, just think about it for a moment, what Jesus had actually done on earth, the miracles that He'd done tended to be the ones and the twos, didn't it? There were exceptions to that, the feeding of the 5,000 or the 25,000, as it may have been. Compare that to, G to, to Peter on the day of Pentecost. After Jesus had died and been resurrected and ascended to God the Father in heaven, and the Holy Spirit has come, and Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and how many people are saved? 3,000! 3,000 are people. 3,000 people uh, come to faith in a single day. Did that ever happen in Jesus' ministry? No. Many people were fed, but not 3,000. Indeed, many people turned away when Jesus preached. Isn't that the truth? Did Jesus ever take the gospel to Asia Minor, to Europe, to Rome? No, He didn't. But you know, within 30 years of this discussion, the men in this upper room we're going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That was the promise as witnesses. Greater things than these. So, the works were quantitatively, not qualitatively, 
quantitatively greater because Jesus had ascended to God the Father and dispatched His Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of uh, the believers. And it was taken out in so many different ways. We're really, really out of time. Two perks, two privileges, the perk of purpose, the perk of proportion, the perk, very briefly, of prayer. Verses 13 and 14, Jesus helps the disciples understand how the job is going to get done. You can imagine what it would have been for them to hear this promise. You're sitting in the upper room, and Jesus says, greater works than these, and you think, really? How on earth are we going to do that? What resources do we have? We're simple men, and whatever you do and whatever you ask in my name, so that my Father may be glorified in the Son, I will do whatever you ask in my name. You can imagine the panic that's running through the disciples' minds. Jesus is going to go. If He's going to go, where are we going to get the resources? Who's going to lead us? Who's going to do these things? Jesus, up until this point, had fed them. Jesus had helped them get their catch. Jesus, He'd, he'd, he'd even provided money for their taxes. Remember Matthew 17? Go to the lake, throw out your line, take in the fish, the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it to them and pay for your taxes and mine. That'd be pretty good, wouldn't it? Right around April, just go fishing. The first fish that you get, open it up, and you'll find all your taxes for the year. Hey, the HMRC wouldn't be a problem then, would it? No, no problem at all. So he's been providing for them in all of these ways, and now he says he's leaving. But he's saying, look, I may be going away, guys, but whatever you need, just ask me for it, and I will resource you. I will resource you. That's momentous, because what it says is the gap, the gap between where Jesus is and where we are is closed the moment we pray. There's no gap. That is life-changing. When we understand prayer to be that way, prayer closes the gap, nullifies the void that is between us. There is no gap. When we pray, it closes the gap. That's the promise. If we take nothing away from today other than that, remember that when we pray, it closes the gap between us and the throne room of heaven where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That is an amazing promise. It's not a blank check. It's not pray for whatever you like. Oh, if I could just have a John Deere 697R, that would be great. You know, it's probably not in Jesus' will that I would have that. You know, please could I have a Scania 750? You're never going to get that. That's not what it means. He says, pray in my name. If you ask for anything in my name, it's to work and to long for the same things that he worked for and longs for. We're praying for the same things. Lord, I'm asking you this because I know that that is what you want. And when he wants it, he will resource us to get it done. 1 John 5, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have asked, that we know that we have what we asked of Him. In Jesus' name, according to His purpose, in line with His character, in harmony with His will, ask me for anything, and I will give it to you. These, then, are the perks of the workforce of the Lord in the workforce of God, in the staff team of heaven. The perk of purpose, the perk of proportion, the privilege of prayer. When is the last time that you asked God, that you prayed to God, that you would see greater works accomplished in your life through your faith in Him? Lord, I want to be a part of your kingdom, your movement, I want you to resource me and direct me. When's the last time you prayed that? Sometimes we haven't because we think, well, the work is just too big. The task is is too big for me. I don't have time. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's just such a big task. 
Let me just give you a wee thing on that. If you've ever gone to a car garage, you recognize that the car garage is not the manufacturer of the car. They are the distributor of the car. We are distributors. We're not manufacturers. It's not our work to manufacture. It's our job to distribute. The burden isn't on us to make things up. We just to distribute the truth. The truth is already there. We're not the manufacturer. We are just the distributor. The enormity of the task should actually spur us on. It's a big task. We want to rise to a challenge. If it was a mediocre commission, or if it was a small commission, or if it was a, if it was a manageable commission, so what? It is the great commission to go to all nations and to make disciples of Jesus. They found that in, in Russia, in its heyday, the Communist Party in Russia, they said that they would call people to an impossible task. That's when they would find the most recruits. People love a challenge. Well, here's our challenge, a noble task to rise up to, to share the good news of Jesus, recognizing that great works are done through a combination of smaller parts. You have a V6 engine, you bolt on a couple of turbos, the thing will go but it's made up of a whole host of smaller, significant components. They may be small. They may be looked at as, well, that's just a solenoid or or whatever. But without that solenoid, without that glow plug, without that fan, without that belt, the engine won't go. We are all a smaller part of a bigger picture. Great works are accomplished by a combination of smaller parts working together together in order that they may fulfill the tasks that they have been called to. We can't do it all, we won't do it all, but we can do our part. We have great perks, the perk of purpose, the perk of proportion, the perk of prayer, and let's do that. Father God, we thank You for Your Word, we thank You for its power, we thank You for its instruction. We pray that we would be uh, encouraged, that we would be inspired to work for You, to do great things in Your name, and for your kingdom. Lord, give us a vision uh, for the expansion of your kingdom here in Loch Bruman and Coigach. Uh, Lord, we pray for an explosion uh, of faith. We pray for a movement of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would use the people that you have set apart in this place for your purposes, that we may recognize our purpose, that we may lay hold of the proportion that we have been given, and that we may exercise the gift of prayer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. i